Hello and welcome to another episode of Two Guys in a Chainsaw. Hello and welcome to another episode of Two Guys in a Chainsaw. I'm Craig. And I'm Todd. I don't even know how to start. (laughs) (laughs) Don't have any themes. It's not a request. (laughs) (laughs) It's a pure, purely from our own imaginations. (laughs) Yeah. We take full responsibility for this one. Or you do. Uh, Yeah, I do. I don't remember why, but for whatever reason, I was just kind of looking through, like I subscribe to pretty much every streaming service that there is now and so i was just looking through all of them at their horror selections and seeing things that looked interesting and i came across a bunch of stuff that actually looked interesting but something that stood out was from netflix uh it's a netflix exclusive i don't think it's a netflix production i just think that they got the rights to it it's actually an italian film called a classic horror story big surprise (laughs) there you choosing an italian movie i almost dropped my computer when i saw that i know well don't think that i didn't have it in mind that (laughs) you would appreciate (laughs) that but it's a modern italian film it is and that's the thing like you love old stuff and i do too i really do but i also really like keeping up with new stuff and this is a 2021 film made in italy the version that i watched which i assume is the one that you watch correct me if i'm wrong was the one that is available on netflix and it's dubbed or subtitled you can choose oh see and i didn't even know that like it just popped up dubbed for me and so that's what i watched usually when i watch foreign films i prefer to watch them in the original language with subtitles just because i kind of prefer to see the actual performance but whatever i mean it was dubbed and uh the dubbing (laughs) was not amazing but uh it was fine well it's par for the course really us watching an italian horror movie that's dubbed into english you know when does that ever happen (laughs) that's true but it's it's also been a while since we've done a foreign film i feel like Mm. The, the premise even though you know all i did was i read the little blurb on Netflix and and I did the same thing. I went to IMDb and and read the blurb and it sounded fairly interesting. And so I thought, you know, why not, (laughs) you know, apropos (laughs) of nothing, why not pick this movie? Uh, And so I did and we watched it. I, I really had very few expectations going in. I had seen some of the images. I watched the trailer But I was really just kind of intrigued by the title, really, a classic horror story. I mean, if you're going to if you're going to name your movie that (laughs) that kind (laughs) of sets some expectations. Right. And uh, I wanted to see what it was all about. But apart from that, I knew nothing about it. I had never heard of it. I just happened upon it scrolling through Netflix. And so I watched it. And here we are. I, I assume you had never heard of this. Well, you know me. I I mean, aside from what happens to pop up and get recommended in my Netflix queue, I don't really stay on top of, I guess I shouldn't admit, (laughs) here that we've had a long-running horror podcast. You're right. I tend to gravitate towards the old stuff and not the new stuff. I don't keep up really as much as you do with all the latest news and horror movies. I like to kind of wait and see if they're proven (laughs) before I'm going to sit down and take my time with them, except unless there's some buzz around it, you know, like the newest It, whatever Jordan Peele's putting out, um, Ari, Asher, those kinds of things. So, no, but uh, just like you, as soon as you proposed it and I pulled it up and I saw that it was an Italian production and also that a classic horror story is written in that font that looks like a throwback to horror movies from the 70s, which was kind of a golden age I think, of horror films, one of them anyway. So I I got kind of excited about it, and I feel like starting to watch the movie, there was a lot of clearly intentional homage, both to Italian horror films and to classic American horror films from that era. So I had a lot. I I really went into it with a pretty open mind and pretty excited. I actually watched the subtitled version with the original Italian. I don't think... I don't know what kind of a difference that really makes, but... uh, So yeah, no, I hadn't heard of it before, and thanks for putting me in the direction of it, Craig. I think we got a lot to talk about here. It, you know, <laughs> one of the reasons why I like the older horror movies is that a lot of times they're just kind of goofy and they don't put me in a sad, depressing state necessarily. Obviously, there are yeah. exceptions, especially from this era, honestly. 
like the 70s for horror tended to be fa- fairly bleak, uh, nihilistic films a lot mm-hmm. of times with these grindhouse productions, which mirrored what was kind of going on with the indie world at Hollywood at the time, really, and the Vietnam War, and just the world was kind of a sad place. This now being a kind of a, I don't want to make it sound too depressed, but like, I don't always feel the best every day, <laughs> you know, with what's going on in the world now. And just it's kind of a weird time. And so I like to see those old, goofy 80s horror films because I know they're going to yeah. be silly and I know I can laugh at them. And then you got to go and throw another bleak sort of nihilistic movie at me that by the time I'm done watching, it, I'm like, ugh. Now I feel like I need to take a shower and I'm not going <laughs> to and my stomach's going to be turning knots for the next day or two until until we finish talking about this and I get it out of my system. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Craig. It's it's funny that you say that. <laughs> if you read, you know, the synopsis, it will tell you that it's this group of people on a road trip and they get stranded and they end up in like this backwoods kind of area and they kind of run into a what ends up being a cult and that (laughs) is is fairly typical i mean we've seen these movies whether you know whether it be a cult or hillbillies or deformed people in a nuclear nuclear fallout space (laughs) or or whatever (laughs) you know yeah it's typical yeah it's a trope right a group of people whether they be you know a group of college kids or high school kids which is very typical or a family i mean this definitely has to me and like like you said i think that there are a lot of throwbacks but it had some very hills have eyes kind Mm -hmm. of vibes to it hills have eyes wrong turn texas chainsaw massacre bunch of people in a van tripping across the country kind of thing yeah and so when i got a little bit into it and i saw that that was kind of what it was going to be like i thought okay you know you did this to yourself it called it a classic horror story and that's (laughs) what it's going to be uh-huh. It's it's going to be typical, though. I thought it was good and though I was entertained and though I was invested in some of the characters, I thought, ah, oh, man, I kind of missed an opportunity. I could have picked something a little bit more unique. You know, this is you know, it is what it is. And it's it's well done. And and I will say that for the movie and like the cinematography and actually the cinematography is quite beautiful. It is. And. Especially for a director that really hasn't done much before this. Just a bunch of shorts, really. Yeah. yeah. I, I I looked at It's directed by two men, Robert mm-hmm. DeFeo and Paolo Stripoli. And you're, like you said, both of them have very limited resumes. So for people like this, it's certainly an impressive outing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's largely filmed outdoors in this beautiful mountainous forest landscape and and the cinematography looks great but the story i thought was typical you know like I, i've seen this movie before little did i know that that was the ruse and that's mm. what ultimately ultimately i walked away from the movie thinking you know what that was pretty clever yeah and, and i don't want to you know i'm sure we'll get into the plot here in a second so i don't want to give anything away but there is a there's a major twist, a huge twist that honestly, even though it is projected, like in hindsight, the twist is projected. I didn't see it coming at all yeah. until about 10 seconds before the reveal, yeah. about 10 seconds before the reveal is like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So our standard warning goes out to everybody. If you're at all interested in seeing this movie now after hearing us tease it a little bit, then turn off the podcast right now. Go out and watch it because we're about to spoil everything for you. So I guess, uh, you know, honestly, my my favorite thing to do on the show is to look up stuff that I like behind the scenes stuff that we can talk about and share. Mm -hmm. And because this movie is so new... I just I I couldn't find much of anything. You know, I I could find uh, viewer reviews and I enjoyed reading those. And and I didn't look at them before 
I watched the movie, but, you know, I read them after and it was fun to read those. And I agreed with many of them. But beyond that, I couldn't find a whole lot about the production or or anything like that. So be ready for maybe a kind of plot heavy episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll see, I guess. You know, we don't plan this stuff, so <laughs> 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 we'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, we'll see how much we have to say about the plot cuz cuz it is fairly typical kind of until the end. But oh, the other thing that I wanted to say to you is that I'm really not still entirely sure what was going on. Mm. So maybe you can enlighten me when we get nearer to the end. Oh, funny. I had the same feeling. Well, <laughs> maybe, hopefully we have two, the two missing pieces to this puzzle in each of our I hands so. so we can put it together. <laughs> it, the opening scene opens in your fairly typical what looks like the interior of maybe a cabin very cabin in the woods very evil dead Mm -hmm. with you know a deer head on the wall and then it pans to this table where this girl is strapped down you know with these heavy leather straps she's bloody clearly in distress And then we see these boots walking towards her, dragging this primitive looking heavy mallet. Looks like it's made out of like a tree stump or something Mm -hmm. with terror in her eyes. You know, she lies there as this masked figure raises the mallet above her head and swings. No, we don't see what happens. We don't see the impact. It immediately cuts backwards and I don't remember if it gave us a timestamp or anything like that. It just cuts back. It does. It just cuts back. But also, there's an eyeball that you can kind of see through a knot in the wood that seems to be That's looking right. in at what's going on. It looks like a kind of a throwback to Black Christmas or some of the Lucio Fulci movies where he seems to be right. kind of obsessed with this kind of thing with the eyes and whatnot. So. It does, but but the eye looking through the wall also appears to be watching in horror. Like, yep. the sense that I got was that somebody was hidden, presumably another quote-unquote good guy, hidden, yep. watching this happen to somebody they know. But that's all we get. And then it cuts back, and we're introduced to our main character, Elisa, who is in a diner. She has a phone conversation with, I presume, her mother. Yeah. Well, first of all, we see her throwing up in the bathroom. And we're like, oh, she's pregnant. Because <laughs> <'cause, laughs> that's how movies tell us women are pregnant. <laughs> that's standard cinematic <laughs> language for pregnancy. You're absolutely <laughs> right. Actually, it just spans all genres because I was just playing The Last of Us 2 uh, on PS4. And exactly the same thing happens. There's a twist that is projected a mile away because one of the characters keeps throwing up. <laughs> <laughs> Especially, you know, like we're both men. <laughs> I feel like they have to project that to men. Like women only vomit if they're pregnant. That's so. right. <laughs> Otherwise, they do not vomit. They do not fart. This doesn't happen. They don't sweat either or smell. <laughs> oh, man. All right. So she throws up, and then she has a conversation with her mom, I guess. Elisa, are you okay? It's the second time I've thrown up. You need to eat something, sweetheart. The surgery is scheduled for tomorrow at 2. The doctor says you have to be in good shape. It's tomorrow? Why? Do you want to wait? No. You're on trial at work, Elisa. You can't afford to have a baby. Yes, I know. It's the best thing to do. And it seems like Elisa is a little bit hesitant, but this is the plan. And then she gets a text on her phone from her rideshare driver. Yeah. It took me a second to figure this out, but that's what it is. She's traveling to the town where she's going to have her abortion, presumably where her family lives, and she's doing a rideshare. And then we are introduced to the other people in the rideshare, and Fabrizio is the driver but he's also an aspiring filmmaker and he's goofy he's the chubby kind you know like Mm -hmm. not stereotypical hollywood good looking guy not an ugly guy per se but you know sets him apart from you know you you have to have the the 
chubby, silly guy. Yeah, right? he's he's the stereotypical chubby, silly, goofy guy who you see in all the horror movies who usually dies about halfway through. <laughs> right. But, yep. you know, who also typically has insight the cinematic knowledge yes. right and insight right <laughs> exactly <laughs> very typical mm. and he's making a video and he's entered you know he's videoing all of these other people in the ride share and getting them to introduce themselves he says that he's making this like for a travel vlog for instagram or something and he does this this is his thing so we're introduced to sophia and mark who are a young couple who are on their way to a wedding sophia i didn't write down any of these actors names because they're all italian actors who i have no familiarity with I didn't recognize any of them from anything. Yeah. Only Mark has been in much. Uh, and he was, he's been in a, quite a bit of TV apparently. Gotcha. But, uh, that's it. Sophia is stunningly beautiful in the girl next door way. She's petite and has long blonde hair and maybe the most striking blue eyes I've ever seen. Yeah. Like just like the, they, they're like sapphires. They just glow. They're gorgeous. Yeah. But to be fair, Elisa's brown eyes are just, like glass, like big, oh, she's glassy, beautiful. gorgeous brown eyes. Both of these women yeah. have incredible eyes. I couldn't believe it. Abs- yeah, and they're, you know, <laughs> big surprise, beautiful girls in a horror movie. Yeah. <laughs> and Mark is, you know, a good looking guy. He's a redhead and uh, he's kind of he's kind of goofy, too, but likable. And they're they're a cute little couple. So because you watch the dubbed version, you might be interested to know that Mark is the only one who speaks English in this oh. group. I don't know if that came through for you, but yeah, everyone else is speaking in Italian and he's speaking in English because he's actually from, uh, was he from somewhere in the UK, I believe. His girlfriend, Sophia, was from, oh, some island country. What was it, she said? She said she was studying in Italy for something. She met Mark while they were studying in school somewhere. I can't remember what, but yeah. So he's actually speaking English in the movie and trying out his Italian um, the guy, when they do speak with him, they do switch to English every now and then to kind of help him out. So uh, there's there's a little bit of English being spoken back and forth as well in Mark's presence and to gotcha, Mark. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Well, and again, like he's kind of he's kind of goofy. It's one of those things where like he seems kind of like a project boyfriend. Like she's maybe a little bit too good for him, but <laughs> he has charm. You know, maybe she can fix him. I don't know. Anyway, and then there's also Ricardo, uh, who introduces himself as a doctor, and he says that he's traveling to see family, and he looks just like, I think his name is Dermot Mulroney, the guy from um, My Best Friend's Wedding, is that his name? I don't know. Looks Mm. very much like that American actor. Um, (laughs) Inconsequential. He's a doctor. He looks a little like he's got stubble. He looks a little rough. He looks like he's going through something. Uh. Yeah, <laughs> he just looks pissed off. You know, he's the guy. You know, when you're feeling that that feeling when you call an Uber and you get in the car and you really are not in the mood to talk with anybody, but the Uber driver is ultra chatty and wants to start talking with you, and you're like, you just want to say, God, can you please just shut up? That's like this guy in this rideshare group, I think. He doesn't want to be chatting with anyone. He just wants to get where he's going. Oh, that's so me too. Like, I haven't done a rideshare <laughs> in forever. Like, do people still do rideshares? Like, does does Uber even still, like, in the in the time of corona? <laughs> <laughs> like, it just Probably seems, a bad idea. It just seems so crazy to get into a car with a stranger who there's a good 75% chance they're going to be drunk. Mm, well... <laughs> You know, Didi actually, which is the the Chinese version of Uber, fun fact, used to have a rideshare option, carpooling option, they called it. And they had to stop it because there were a couple high-profile cases where a person ended up getting murdered. So they quit that whole program entirely. <laughs> I've, I've only done it once or twice. I mean, I live in a small town and have a car, so there's no reason for me to yeah. use Uber. But when I've traveled into larger cities, I've done Uber and I've done rideshare. But I'm the Ricardo. Like, I'm not here to make friends. <laughs> like, I'm here because it's <laughs> right. cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> Are you like that at the table, too, at Applebee's, where the guy's like, hey, I'm Jimmy. I'm going to be your server today. Can yeah. I? Can you start you off with anything? Are you just like, get me my ice? Yeah. Tea Thanks, and- Jimmy. <laughs> Nice. No, I am super, super friendly with uh, service providers because I worked in the food industry for a very long time. And so I'm the guy who <laughs> is super, super overly friendly 
to to servers because I know uh, that they deal with a lot of what they're going bullshit. Through. Yeah. Uh, and, and and Fabrizio asks Elisa where she's going. She just says she's going to see family, which arguably is true, but it's not. Like, mm-hmm. Oh, I'm on my way to my abortion. How are you? <laughs> and then there's a l- bunch of little stuff along the way, just on the ride. Like somebody looks at a newspaper and it shows that a mother and her young daughter have gone missing in the area. And they have some talk about the mafia. I guess this is Southern Italy and this is where... Mm-hmm the mafia originated and i don't know there's a whole thing about like these three groups or three families or something which apparently is real i don't know enough about but one of these three entities ended up being the costranosa as we know as the mafia right and and there's another picture in a, a magazine or a newspaper or something of this woman who i guess is a head mafia figure or something and like mark makes fun of or or is that does does she's the mayor oh she's the mayor okay yeah she's the mayor and it's all just very quick and you don't think it's necessarily going to be important but at the same time me having seen these movies a million times i'm like why would they show us this if it weren't going to be something right but you know it's it's tossed away and they they pull over at one point so that a large eliza can puke more because she's pregnant. <laughs> and at that point, Mark takes over the driving. Now, Fabrizio had invited them all to have beers. And Mark was like, awesome, you just got your five stars. <laughs> you know, which is cool. And that's a thing. You know, these drivers for these companies, they do rely on their ratings. Yeah. And and so, you know, I've seen all kinds of crazy stuff online where they offer all kinds of like water and snacks and like all kinds yeah. of things. Wish they'd offer me beer. That would be great. We right. I know. Get water. <laughs> so, so, so they they all have beers, including Eliza, Eliza, because Mark basically forces her to. Yeah. It, it appears that she doesn't want to. I guess because she's pregnant. I don't really know why she's all that concerned about it. If she's going to have an abortion anyway, but right. whatever. Or maybe she just doesn't want to drink. And friends out there in internet land, don't force people to drink. Correct. If people pass up drinks. They have reasons. Respect it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. This public service announcement brought to you by Two Guys in a Chainsaw. Also, don't drink and drive. Right. And and what happens here, I believe, is that Mark is insisting he's going to drive, but Fabrizio doesn't want him to, right? Stop. You can't. Can get out what of the there. fuck are you doing? You can't. Driving like this, we'll get to the wedding, and there'll be grandparents already. Uh, okay, look, this company is my mother's, okay? She never lets anyone drive it. If something happens, she will smash my head what in. What are you doing? I'm taking over. Maybe you're drunk. Yeah, I drive better when I'm uh, drinking. What a dickhead. Hey, you can take the wheel if you don't feel safe, Doc. It's no problem. I don't have my driver's license with me. Problem solved, then? No, my ass problem solved. Problem not solved. Is that clear? And as they're driving down in the middle of the night, the the road, they're both sitting there drinking beers when suddenly there is a dead goat in the middle of the road, which Mark looks up and Fabricio freaks out and leans over and yanks the wheel so that they avoid hitting this goat in the middle of the road, but instead hit a tree. Mm-hmm. And at that moment, I was thinking, you are an idiot. You, yeah. you don't yank the car off the road because there's a dead animal in the middle of it. I mean, yeah, you can bump on it. If you're going fast, you could you could damage your car. But so much better to run over that thing or partially run over it than to swerve yeah. and cause a bigger accident, which is exactly what happens. Right. And, they hit a tree and, you know, they yeah. were going full speed. But then it cuts to the morning and Elisa wakes up. And here's commotion. Um, It turns out Mark has a broken leg, which Ricardo, being a doctor, splints. Of course, they have no cell reception. But the (laughs) the biggest thing is somebody says, well, first they say call 118 or whatever the equivalent is of 911 in Italy. And of course, they have no cell reception, obviously. But then Ricardo says... Well, go flag somebody out on the road. And Elisa looks out the window and says, there is no road. Yeah. And they go out and explore and there isn't. They are nowhere near a road. And this is just totally inexplicable. They have no idea what's going on. But they find this strange house 
like I don't know how to describe it. It's almost like kind of like a modern Hansel and gretel thing or kind of a cross between yeah. a house and a church or something. It's just That's really, what I would say. It's interesting It's got kind of a weird star-shaped roof in a way, doesn't it? With a, with a very prominent window up at the top that right. is like, always glowing. Right, right. <laughs> like there's light coming from inside. Yeah. And there are big like telephone poles with loudspeakers outside. Mm-hmm. Lights. But there's nobody there. Uh, and Ricardo and Fabrizio go looking for the road, but they don't find anything. They they try to get in the house, but there's nobody there. And so basically, they just go back to the camper. They find three scarecrow oh, type right. things in the woods, though. It's a shrine of some sort, obviously. It looks like Blair Witch Project yeah. type stuff, a sh- or, or you know, any one of these cult movies uh, that are in the woods, sort of ancient cult type stuff, where they're putting together things with sticks and and twine and stuff. Yeah. Well, and actually, I mean, it it ends up being <laughs> obviously significant. You know, there are these three like large straw figures, somewhat human shaped effigies but then underneath them are five pigs heads on spears and there are five of them (laughs) it's interesting yeah i mean what's interesting about this movie is that they're calling i I like the fact that they're actually calling out to our expectations in this movie directly like when they find the five pigs heads they go back to the cabin and somebody actually says please tell me there weren't five heads uh-huh. on those pikes. And they're like, yeah, there were five. Like, they go ahead and make the connection for us, you know? The same thing, when those two are walking through the woods, uh, I think it's Fabrizio who brings up... One time, I saw this America movie, right? About these people who end up in a sort of limbo, and they are not aware of it. So they are like in a trap, you know? And they are doomed to repeat the same things. For example, they wake up and it's always the same day. Or they go downstairs and it's always the same floor, you know? And it's so funny because he was speaking what I was thinking. I'm trying to figure out what happened, you know, with this movie. It's obviously super mysterious. Did they all die in the accident and are they in like purgatory limbo now? And so, you know, again, being a classic horror story... Fabrizio continues to bring up these notions throughout the film, makes these connections between what happens in classic horror movies and what's happening to them now. Kind of like, uh, what's his name in Scream? Randy. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So as soon as he brings it up, I'm thinking, okay, well, then that's not going to be it. You know? And and it kept the mystery alive for me a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And this, it, it, this is totally typical. There usually is that guy who can make these connections. Eventually, somebody notices the door was locked on the house originally. But uh, at some point, they see that the door is open. And Elisa goes in the house, and uh, she hears things in the house. And she ends up in this one room that has all of these lit candles. And everybody mm-hmm. joins her in there. And there are all of these pictures like weird culty pictures of people in masks and there are these pictures of these three frightening hooded masked figures and Fabrizio being from that area knows that it's a reference to a piece of folklore from the area and he says that they are the three knights of honor he says, uh, the first has no eyes, but even in, even in the dark, he will find you. The second has not ears, but he will surely hear you. The third has no mouth to speak, but if you see him, don't say a word. The winged horse by their side is the song of death. And he says, it's the legend of some Italian words that I don't know. Ostro, Matoso, and Cargagnoso, or something like that. Good for you. <laughs> you. you know, uh, fun fact, I think that means bone, middle bone, and heel bone, I think. Well, and I, I like I said, I guess that there is some truth to this legend. Now, I, I... Well, supposedly, I think it's an urban legend that... You know, it's like a historical, right. what it is, is it's, it's like a historical, probably not true myth of how the, the three Italian mafia families started, 
which is that somewhere in the 15th century, there were these three brothers, and their da- their sister got raped by some guy, and so they enacted revenge and went and killed this person, but then they got in trouble for it, so either they were exiled or they escaped to an island near Sicily, and while they were there, uh, they devoted themselves to God and put together rules for uh, society, like a new society they wanted to create, and each of them kind of had their own spin on it, I guess. And then years later, once they left there, each of them took these rules for society and started each of the Italian mafia families, the three most famous ones or the three big ones. Probably not. Actually, there's no I was I was looking this up because I really knew we had to address this, but there's absolutely no evidence that this is actually true. It's mostly folklore and mythology, but uh, it sounds cool. Right. It's really neat. And when I say there's some truth to it, I just mean that, like, this really is a legend. Oh, um, right. Not, not that, made not up that for it's the movie. true. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. But also, again, similar to kind of The Wicker Man, um, mm-hmm. even one that we watched recently, uh, Apostle. Yeah. Strong Apostle vibes. In, in that movie, yeah, they, you know, they made their own society, made their own rules, all, all that kind of stuff. The Village. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, then, I don't know, he, he says that um, these three brothers came from another world and they came to this village that was starving and they offered to help them, but they required a sacrifice. Um, and so the village, I guess, very um, Shirley Jackson's The Lottery style, like yeah. picked somebody to be the sacrifice and they cut out that person's tongue and ears and eyes and these brothers did rid the village of hunger but then those people that they saved he says they became like a flock their flock and so okay so they see all that they're spooked out but there's really not much they can do so they plan to sleep in the camper and leave in the morning and when they're sitting in the camper Fabrizio says outright he like he 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 recaps everything that they've done. We crash into a tree a few feet from the road, and we wake up in front of the house of Sam Raimi. There are severed animal heads, pictures of crazy farmers. We are isolated. The phones don't work. Why hasn't anyone said it yet? This is the setup for a classic horror. Movie. Go to sleep, man. Yeah. <laughs> and then the title card comes up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and then, as tends to happen, he goes into the woods late at night, the foggy woods with, you know, the moonlight shining through the trees to pee. And he hears something and he sees these two hooded masked figures in the woods. The people in the RV hear what sounds like a child's scream coming from the cabin. So the girls first go to check it out, which I thought was interesting. Like the guys are like, yeah, "Yeah, that's cool. Go ahead. (laughs) (laughs) So much for chivalry. (laughs) Keep in mind, Mark can't leave because he's I mean, he's hop. He's his leg is broken. He would be hobbling if he tried to leave the, the, the camper. And eventually, I mean, Fabrizio and Roberto or whatever his Ricardo, whatever his name is, follow right behind and join them. And as soon as that happened, I'm like, oh, Mark's fucked. Yeah. (laughs) 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 Me too. (laughs) He's disabled. They left him alone in there. He's dead. Well, Fabrizio comes in quite urgently, right? I mean, he's like, hey, there's stuff in the woods. We got to get out. We got to get out. And the doctor's kind of reluctant to leave. But he's like, no, man, no, man. We got to go. We got to go. We got to go to the house. Yeah. And so he kind of forces him out of there. That's a little important, right? I don't know. Mark's asleep or something. I don't know. Yeah, he's he sleeps from the time he's injured, which probably is probably really pretty realistic. Mm. I, I think that when your body is in pain, sleep is like a natural instinct to try to, you know, ignore or heal, be unaware of the pain. Right. So they're all in there. They go up into the attic and they find a kid, a young girl, like encased in this weird kind of haystack and her tongue has been cut out and is in a jar right next to her. And then all of a sudden, these red lights come on outside 
and the sirens sirens start blaring through those loudspeakers. Oh yes. And the little girl is scared and crying and all of this looks great. Oh, like it does. The red light looks fantastic. It's very spooky, but it's also still the cinematography is still very clear like it's not dark it you know yeah. you can see everything very clearly it, it, it looks i was really impressed me too and, and it's scary well it, you know and there's like a siren sound and then elisa for some reason she's kind of like backed up against the window and she's a little terrified by all this she's just staring on and she's sort of illuminated from behind by this bright red window and it starts kind of slowly zooming in on her and i mean i was just getting total suspiria vibes there yeah, oh yeah. Definitely a call back to um, Argento's work in Suspiria. It was very much that stark red, this girl standing there kind of terrified. It was it was very otherworldly, a little abstract, uh, very colorful. It was, it was really cool, actually. I mean, this movie does that a lot, where it just hits you with these throwbacks to classic horror films, and I liked that. It did it really smoothly. Yeah, I didn't make that connection, but you're absolutely right. Um, and now I have all of these images of, and it's not just Argento either. I feel like, well, maybe it was his signature, and maybe we've watched more than one of his movies. But I'm thinking of that movie where somebody shot somebody through a keyhole. What was that? Oh movie? yes. Oh God, which one was that? I don't remember which one, but yeah, yeah. I don't remember. It's very much but that like one that. had a lot of the bright colors illuminating mm-hmm. people too. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I hadn't thought of that, but it definitely is reminiscent uh, of that. But they look out the window and they see these masked people dragging Mark into the house. His girlfriend is screaming and wants to go down and try to help. But uh, Ricardo uh, holds her back and won't let her. And so they all just silently watch as these people strap Mark to that table. Mm. (laughs) I guess I should have mentioned this is the cabin that we saw in that opening scene. They break both of his legs with mallets misery style. Yeah. Very close up and very brutal. And then they drive spikes into his eyes with a turn screw that, my goodness, I mean, this and Apostle yeah. had to be made <laughs> around the same time. No kidding, right? But this scene was almost exactly the same. It really was. As that scene from Apostle. I was pretty shocked. Uh, is it a coincidence? I don't know. but I don't know. I I don't think they copied it, but it's I, I do I imagine it's a coincidence, but they are strikingly similar. Yes. And it takes its time with it though, and it goes through the eyes instead of his head. And there are these close up shots of where they crank this thing down and these spikes are just millimeters away from this guy's terrified eyes. And it lingers there for a while and the camera shows us several angles. Again, very reminiscent of Fulci. You remember Zombie? When we saw yes. that spike coming at that girl's eye. And and he does that in a number of his movies. He loves a sort of injury to eye kind of stuff. It's really shocking. Um, Argento does some of it, too, where you get these close-ups. Well, <laughs> well gosh, I, I'm, I, I feel really stupid because I can't remember any of these movies. But what was that the, that movie where the killer would, um, like, pry their eyes open? Yeah, opera. Yeah. Yes, yes. But <laughs> seriously... I don't even think as an actor that I could do this. Those spikes <laughs> were so close to his eyeballs. Yeah. His eyelashes, you could see his eyelashes touching the spikes. Yeah. Uh, Super scary. I don't think I could do it. <laughs> yeah. We've talked about this before. It's been a while, but eyes, teeth, you know, like there are just things that we just make us cringe. Yeah. And this was definitely uh, cringeworthy. Thankfully, but they, they kill him. show it right up close no, up they like don't. they show Thank the goodness. feet getting broken. That was a nice bit of restraint there. I appreciated that. And the feet getting broken, that was so fast. Like it was a split second, but it looked great. Yeah, it really did. I have absolutely no idea what the budget was on this movie, but it had to be pretty darn high because it looks really good and the effects are good. There's not a lot of major effects like that, but what's there just looks really great. And they drag his body out and then the lights and the sirens go off. Um, in the morning, they get the little girl out of the straw and she clings to Eliza and, or Elisa, <laughs> I don't know how her name is pronounced. <laughs> Ricardo's like, she's your responsibility now. Oh, 
okay. (laughs) (laughs) After he pries her out. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And Sophia is pretty despondent, as one would be, I would think, after Mm. watching a loved one get brutally murdered. But they take off through the woods with the little girl in tow, and they find a car graveyard, which is so Hills Have Eyes. Yeah. I'm, it's happened in other movies, but especially the remake of Hills Have Eyes, I vividly remember when the one character finds the place where these cannibalistic mutants store all of the cars of their victims. Yeah. <sighs> There's some infighting going on. Actually, for a while, I thought it drug out a little bit long. Ricardo and Sophia are fighting for a while, and it's not really important. The little girl, we she can't talk, but I guess she pulls a notebook out of her car. Now, I assume that this little girl is supposed to be the little girl from the news clipping that we saw in the beginning. Mm, I think so, yeah. And her name is Chiara, and she gets a, a notebook journal kind of thing she shows um elisa some things in there and elisa asks her is there a way out of this forest and kiara writes in her notebook it's not a forest Mm. and i i i don't know like it's not like that's you know the guy had already said fabrizio had already said you know i've seen all these movies where you know, time doesn't seem to matter and they just keep reliving the same experiences and the same days over and over again. It's not like this is unique. I've seen them too. But that that one line, it's not a forest. It just had my mind going everywhere. What is it? Yeah, me too. <laughs> I know. If it's then not what a forest, is it then? What is it? And then and Eliza kind of asks, well, what do you mean by that for a, about a minute? And then they get distracted by something else. And then they never do it, never come back to it again. And I'm like, please c- interrogate this girl. You got to ask her what she meant by that. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> they get they end up back at the house again. Like Fabrizio is like, I swear to God, we were going south the whole time. I was watching the sun and they end up back at the house. But the camper's gone. They decide that it's safer even if the people come back they decide that it'd be safer to be inside than outside and fabrizio's like oh well at least they like he finds a beer on the ground at least they left us this one beer so they go inside and sundown comes and they share this beer and there's lots of talking and the doctor tells his sad sad backstory boring (laughs) and then it cuts to black and then it comes back up and the red lights and the sirens are going off again elisa kind of slowly wakes up and i was like what these sirens are loud like why wouldn't they immediately wake up but as it turns out she and fabrizio are the only ones in the house she goes outside and there's a huge cult of masked people like a a huge wicker i i hesitate to say wicker man because it doesn't really look like the wicker man from the movie but it's like a big straw yeah like a bonfire thing but kind of shaped like a person and sophia and ricardo are tied to stakes and the little girl is in the middle again encased in straw and elisa is standing there looking at them and all of the cultists are just staring at her fabrizio grabs her drags her back inside the cultists do this weird clicking stuff with like super weird have no idea what that's all about and then they cut off ricardo's ear they cut sophia's eye off they put it on like a weird face thing they already have the tongue from the little girl and then they hoist this face up to the top of that straw man. Yeah. So, and, and then they slit Ricardo and Sophia's throats. And I was so sad because Sophia was so pretty. And not just that she was pretty, but she was really cool. Like, yeah, <laughs> I really liked her and I didn't, I figured she'd get it, but I didn't want to. Then it's just Elisa and Fabrizio in there. And he's like, Oh my God, what's happening? And she's crying. And he's like, do you mind if I hug you? <laughs> and as and as soon as he said that, in my notes I have is Fabrizio in on it? <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. And then immediately, like I said, I figured it out ten seconds before it was revealed because Elisa's like. 
why didn't we wake up when all of this was going on? Obviously, it had to be a big production for them to put all this together. And she realizes that the beer was drugged and that Fabrizio hadn't drank any of it. And when he hugs her, she hears something. And it turns out he's wearing an earpiece. Yeah. And the person in the earpiece is like, Bring her out or something. Bring her, put her under the, put her under the, uh, the deer antlers on the wall or something like that. Move her, move her over there. And so she, she calls him out and he tries to cover for himself, but eventually he says, you know, he calls her some nasty names and she, he says, you ruin it all. And I have in my notes, is he making a movie? Because he has said, (laughs) he said that he is an aspiring filmmaker and at this point this is where i got very confused Mm -hmm. because i didn't know what was real and what was not but he says you know he calls out just take her and this masked guy comes in and drags her out and then she wakes up in midsummer (laughs) have you seen midsummer yet oh don't spoil it for me please no i haven't seen it (laughs) i won't spoil it for you but this exact festival happens oh okay (laughs) <laughs> Not nailed down. She's nailed to a chair. And the mayor of the town that we had seen in the picture in all red is sitting at the head of the table opposite her at the other end with all of these rural cultivists in between. And there's a weird disfigured boy singing a song about that you know, the three brothers or whatever. The mayor is obvious, like the leader of this cult and they all start eating. And when Elisa starts crying, they all mock her. The mayor goes to her and this woman, I mean, she looks, she's classic, great, uh, older Italian yeah. woman, you know, decked out in a complete red suit, heavy makeup. And okay, here's where I start to get confused. So correct me if I'm wrong. Apparently the cult is the mafia and this is how they have to sustain themselves by sacrificing people i don't think so because you're right she does mention well the mafia is not what it used to be and then she walks away from that whole table thing to a waiting police car so you can kind of see that the police are in on it too no i think what it is is fabrizio is making these movies these snuff films basically but they're being funded by the mafia because only the mafia could like drag up the resources to pull this off and then later, you know, distribute it and make money from it. I think that's what's actually going on. And the mayor, because the mayor is connected to the mafia, then she has the ability to kind of make sure all this happens there inside inside her city. See, but I couldn't figure out, like, I thought that this, like, that's what it turns out to be. Eventually... Um, she gets put in a room with a bunch of monitors that show all of what end up being, it turns out they're all set pieces. Mm -hmm. The cabin is a set piece. The shrine was a set piece. Everything was a set piece. And he's making this movie. But I thought that that whole table scene, including the mayor, I thought that was a scene from the movie that he's making. I don't. Yeah, that's that's a little odd, right? Because when you think through it, it, that wouldn't make sense that it would be included in his movie. Because then it kind of gives away what's going on, you know, to like the real police or something, you know. But that's the thing, like I, but, because I question. I don't think that woman was really the mayor. I think oh. that she's an actress. I think that could be that that showing that him having that picture for them to see and comment on i think that was all part of the setup i think that Mm. that was still part of them making the movie oh maybe i could be wrong i don't know but this is the part that kind of blew my mind (laughs) because fabrizio like she sees on this set of monitors all of these set pieces but then the monitors all go blank and his head pops up on all of them not individually but like his whole like it it forms a composite of his face and he explains what he's doing and i felt that this was really social commentary that was a little too real and too scary yeah um yeah you know he talked about how people like 
horror movies, but they're not really impressed and they're not really scared. But then they go home and they watch the news and that is all the all the news shows is the horrors of humanity because that's what the consumers want. Right. They want to see pain and misery and murder and horror. And that's why that's all the news focuses on. And he says, so I'm making this movie. This is going to be the new, you know, this is where entertainment is going. And and basically what he's talking about is snuff films where, you know, he, he really kills people in his movies because that's what people want to see. Yeah. Uh, it's crazy. It's definitely social commentary. The movie's brimming with it by this point. I, I honest to God did not see it coming. And and frankly, up until the point of that reveal, I thought the movie's fine, but I've seen it before. Yeah. I was actually, you know, I was I was thinking, oh God, Todd's not gonna like it because it's pretty typical, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And then this happened. And I was like, wait, oh my gosh. It's pretty cool, but it's also a little bit like martyrs in that respect. And it's also a little bit like funny games, right? A little bit in, in, in its thematic material. Like, you want to see violence? All right, we're going to show you violence kind of thing. And now, how do you feel about it? Did that entertain you? Mm, that's <laughs> you know, true, right. It's not Pointing like this, back at the audience. Yeah, it's not like this is a new idea, but... Um, but it's a new, different execution yeah, of it, and for it, sure. Yeah, and it surprised me. And as he's talking to her... She laughs in his face and says, your movie totally sucks. It's just a carbon copy of other movies, which is true. (laughs) Which is true. (laughs) (laughs) But that, of course, pisses him off. And he says, well, this this is how the story goes from now on. And she says, not my story. And he says, we'll see. And um, then he he cuts out and the screens go blank. She pulls her hands off the night or off the nails that she's nailed to the chair by, which is gruesome, but looks great. Um, Mm. She goes out of the trailer that she's in and ends up on what I describe as a back lot. It's not a studio back lot, but it's clearly like the back lot of a film set with lots of trailers Mm -hmm. With all of the props and all, you know, everything's a prop. The dead goat was a prop. Um, They've even kept all of the bodies of the victims, I assume, in case they might need them later for reshoots. (laughs) And the only thing that she's concerned about is finding the little girl. And I loved this twist, too. It turns out the little girl was in on it. Yeah. In fact, I'm not even sure if she was really a little girl. The, she and Fabrizio are talking and kind of arguing with one another in one of the trailers. And at one point he calls her a dwarf. Now, she doesn't look like somebody with actual dwarfism. But I wondered if she was actually a young adult hmm. who just looked very young. And she's totally in on it. She's been playing it the whole time. Yeah. Call back to Wicker Man there, too. Uh-huh. And, and it, she also, doesn't he say something like, isn't she his sister? Yes. And like, I think their yeah. mother is the producer. <laughs> the mayor producer slash mafia person. Yeah. I, 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 it's a little bit ambiguous unless it's not. And it just went over my head. I don't know. Um, but eventually, Kiata puts her costume back on because it was just a costume all along and opens the trailer door. And Elisa is standing outside. She has costumed herself as one of the townspeople and put on one of their masks. And she's standing there with a shotgun. And Kiata's like, oh, shit, or something. (laughs) And Elisa blows her away. And then Fabrizio comes running out. And she, uh, she shoots him in the knee. And he starts crawling away. And she is filming this. She set up a camera. Mm-hmm. And he uh, pleads with her not he's like, I, I can make this good for you, you know, all kinds of things. And eventually she flips him over on his back and points the shotgun right at his head. And she says, don't worry, it's only a movie. <laughs> and she blows <laughs> his head off. And then she walks back to the camera and says, there, you have your ending. <sighs> and then again, I'm still a little confused. She walks into the forest. The sirens go off again. The little deformed boy who was singing before is not deformed. It was just makeup, apparently. And he's there 
in swim trunks and water wings. And they look at each other for a while and he turns off and runs and she starts chasing him and he leads her through a fence, which has a sign that's like no trespassing military establishment. But I couldn't tell if they were going into the military establishment or out from it. Out from it, I think. Okay, I think so, too. Yep. And then she ends up on a crowded public beach. Yes. Apparently just filled with tourists who are because she looks terrible. She's bloody and they're all filming her with their cell phones. And she just walks into the sea. And then that's basically the end, except for there is a a credit scene. Did you stick around for the yeah. credit scene? I sure did. Boy, that was something. It's, <laughs> it, it's so meta. Because the yeah. credit scene is this guy watching what was it, Blood Flicks, like or yeah. or something like that. Instead Not Netflix. Netflix, but like Blood Flicks, F L I X, configured exactly the same as Netflix. Like it's obviously Netflix, mm -hmm. and he's just clicking through horror movies, and he clicks on a classic horror story, and he's. Uh, scans through and watches a little bit of the early part of the movie and then he scans through and watches just the scene where Elisa shoots Fabrizio and then he closes it out and clicks the thumb down and then goes to have dinner with his family like yes like I mean he he's clearly us you know we're yeah. we're watching this and the suggestion is, this is what really happened, and now we're just watching it on Netflix. Yeah. Uh, I just, ultimately, I thought it was really clever. Now, the, it, it takes a while. You have to get through that first hour, which is, which is apparently very, you know what to expect, you know what it is. But when the twist comes, I did not see it coming, and I thought that it was very clever. And in total, I ended up thinking it was pretty cool. Yeah, me too. So here's my theory on the movie. I think that this woman was really the mayor, but also in heavily involved in the mafia. I don't think we ever know the name of the town, do we? Or it could mm -hmm. be fictional. Could I don't not think be. so. Anyway, and so they've set up this milit this fake military installation just to keep people out. The sirens and lights come on to hide the screams and stuff from everybody else in the town because it would be obvious otherwise that they would hear what's going on when the murders are happening. But because it's a military installation, it just sounds like military exercises or a something. A drill, right, on. whatever. So that, that, yeah, that masks that. And then, of course, when she, when she pops out of there and ends up right there on the beach, this is total social commentary where, um, of course, it's the horrifying thing. It's like it's like the village in a way, isn't it? Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then she pops out and instead of anybody rushing to help her or whatever, like she's obviously bloodied and distressed and holding herself and walking away. Everybody just takes out their camera and starts filming yeah. it. Like. Again, this spills into real life. Yep. We've been so desensitized to violence, perhaps through media, movies, whatever, or through the cameras on our phones, that our first instinct, and we've seen this, right, is yeah. just to film what's going on around us, even as bad as it is. Gosh, there was a there was a news article the other day about somebody who was getting raped or something, like in the middle of the street or whatever, and I don't remember if it was New York or where it was, and there were more people filming it than helping. Yeah. And so this is, yeah, it's pretty sad commentary. She walks into the water, and I want to think everything's going to be okay. A part of me thought, oh, did she just, like, drown herself in sadness? Or was this a kind of baptism? Is she deciding she's going to keep her baby because she kind of starts holding her stomach as she goes out there? We don't really know. I want to think that she's fine. <laughs> And then, of course, like you just said, to wrap up the meta of the whole thing, it's like even this movie that we've just seen, ah, it was okay. Give it a thumbs down. Whatever. Seen it before. <laughs> mm -hmm. All this brutal stuff happened, and we don't even give it a mind. Yeah. I mean, it was a great movie. And like I just said, you make me watch these things that uh, 
point an uncomfortable mirror up in front of me and then uh, make me feel sick for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, yeah, thanks. thanks. <laughs> I wanna, next week, let's just do another goofy 80s slasher, all right? Well, it's your but no, pick, so. I really did enjoy it. I really enjoyed it, just like you. I thought it was super clever. I loved the meta part of it. I thought it hit all the right notes. It was The pacing was great. The filmmaking was great. I loved the callbacks to classic movies. I think if you're a horror fan, you're going to enjoy this even more yes. than just your more casual viewer because you're going to get a lot of this stuff. It, in fact... You'll probably get it more and appreciate it more if you are, simply because you'll get the point they're trying to make. I I remember watching A Cabin in the Woods with my dad, and he hated that movie. And I'm like, why? Oh, my God, this is one of the most clever things I've ever seen. And I realized it's because he didn't know the tropes. Right. He'd never really seen many of these horror movies and didn't understand what they were poking fun at. And so I think that if you're a horror fan, you're going to get this immediately, maybe more so than some but some casual viewer oh, and appreciate it all the more. I, I, I totally agree. Uh, another example, my mom, who's not a fan of horror films, uh, wanted to indulge my dad on Halloween. And so they watched Halloween Kills together mm -hmm. um, and she absolutely hated it. And I understand why, because that whole movie, the, the substance of that whole movie is throwbacks to mm. all of the rest of the series. And she's not familiar with the rest of the series. So yeah. whereas my dad and I reveled in it, I didn't think it was an amazing movie, but I reveled in those things. You know, she had no context for it. And so the same thing here, I don't think, uh, yeah, if, if you're not a fan of horror, I don't think you're going to like this, but. If you are, I think you'll really like it. And it's going to push your buttons just like, again, like Martyrs did for me, like Funny Games did for me. You know, as horror fans, there is this sort of inner tension where you're thinking, God, why do I find this stuff so entertaining when it should be so horrifying and, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's a hard thing that we have to explain to people and also to ourselves from time to time. And then to have, like I said, this mirror thrown up in front of you and God, another movie that's sort of pointing that out and making me feel guilty, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, fair point. Fair point, indeed. <laughs> All right. Well, if, I, if you haven't seen this movie, I hope you didn't listen to the podcast because it'll be spoiled for you. And the the most fun for me was the surprise. I was. It, it's so rare in these types of movies that I don't see the twist coming, and I really didn't. Mm. But regardless, if you do watch this movie or have watched this movie and you have anything to say or you have any insights that we missed, because we do miss things a lot. <laughs> We're not all that smart, really. <laughs> <laughs> not really, no. <laughs> Please uh, feel free to let us know uh, on Facebook or you can direct message us or comment on our webpage or whatever. And uh, if you enjoyed it, please share it with a friend or your friends. You can find us everywhere you can find podcasts. Anyway, as always, thank you very much for listening. And until next time, I'm Craig. And I'm Todd. With two guys in a chainsaw. Ah.